Section 68 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Exercise Physical exercises are absolutely essential to health. The working man, however, is likely to obtain enough of it from his daily action, but those of sedentary habits, especially those who work indoors, will not receive sufficient exercise from their labor. While the gymnasium is to be recommended, and while it has done much to make weak people strong, I would not advise any one to take more than very simple gymnasium exercises without the advice of a physician. Exercises may be taken in the bedroom with the use of light dumbbells or without the use of any apparatus at all. Walking is the best of all, for it can be enjoyed by those in poor health or physically weak. It takes one out of doors, and exercise out of doors is far better than that taken in a closed room. If you exercise at home, open all of the windows. Everyone should walk at least two miles a day in the open air, unless he is very weak. Select a companion, as exercise is more efficacious if enjoyed and is not mere exercise by itself. Take long breaths in the open air every morning. Over-exercise, and much of that practiced by athletes, injure the heart and work opposite from the intention. No strenuous exercise should be taken after midlife without the advice of a physician. Any good doctor will prescribe a course of exercises for you at a nominal fee, most of them not charging more than a dollar for advice. Then, those who exercise need more food and a different kind of food from that required by those who do not exercise. As cases differ, it is inadvisable for me to prescribe proper food. Consult your physician. Extinguishing fires from coal oil. Do not attempt to smother the flame by water. Smother it with a carpet or cloth. Fainting. Ordinary fainting is distinct from that which occurs from shock or collapse, the latter following serious injuries, while fainting is common with some people and may not be serious. Those who are subject to frequent fainting spells should consult a physician that he may locate the cause. If fainting is caused from any disease of the heart or from a weak heart, death may follow, and such persons should be under care of a physician. When fainting occurs, place the patient on his back with his head as low or lower than the body. Raise the legs. He should have plenty of fresh air. If fainting occurs in a crowd, ask the spectators to move away. If indoors, open all doors and windows, loosen the clothing, and sprinkle water upon the face, at the same time applying smelling salts or spirits of camphor held close to the nose, but not touching it. The body may be rubbed to assist the circulation. If the person does not quickly revive, apply gentle heat or a mustard plaster to the pit of the stomach. When he recovers, give him hot tea or coffee, and never more than a moderate amount of alcoholic stimulants. Keep him in a reclining position for some time after he has recovered. End of section 68. Recording by phone. Section 69 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Feeding an Invalid If the illness is at all serious, Consult the physician. He will tell you what and what not to give the patient in the way of food. 
never cook the food in the presence of the invalid and keep the smell of cooking away from him don't eat in his presence as it may annoy him serve everything attractively with spotless napkin tablecloth and ware be careful not to spill anything hot articles should be served very hot and cold ones very cold as lukewarm viands are not acceptable everything brought into the sick room should be covered with dishes or napkins better bring in too little than too much more to be served if the patient desires it fire in the house when the house is a fire cover the head if possible with a wet cloth or dry one if there is no facility for wetting it cutting holes for the eyes creep on the floor and don't stand up or walk for the air is clearer next to the floor as smoke rises unless there are plenty of exits a knotted rope should be attached to a staple it is easier to climb down a knotted rope than one which is smooth if necessary to jump from an upper story throw out a mattress or something else which is soft and attempt to land upon it when at a hotel or boarding house ascertain the means of exit before retiring fits generally speaking the treatment should be similar to that given to one who has fainted if the patient is hysterical apply mustard plasters or ice to the soles of his feet and the wrists but do not dash water in the face or use strong emetics or heroic measures if the fit is caused by epilepsy in this case the person is rigid do not attempt to stop the patient from struggling lay him on his back with his head somewhat raised and loosen his clothing if necessary hold his arms and legs gently but do not use force place a stick or knife handle between the teeth to prevent biting the tongue always summon a physician frostbite never place the patient near a fire undress him carefully and pack frozen parts with cloths wet with ice water rub adjacent parts vigorously administer hot coffee or tea if breathing appears to have stopped treat him as you would one apparently drowned when the patient begins to revive place him in a warm but not hot room cover him with blankets and rub him with a cloth wrung out of hot water give him the ordinary stimulants but not alcoholic ones fumigating a sick room formalin is probably the best fumigator place the articles to be fumigated in a closed room and pour formaldehyde over towels or bed linen and place on the floor the room should remain closed for 24 hours a room containing a hundred square feet of floor surface requires at least a pint of formaldehyde end of section 69 recording by phone section 70 of a thousand things worth knowing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a thousand things worth knowing by nathaniel c fowler jr getting things into the eye nose ear etc eye Sometimes complications result of a more serious nature. A physician should be sent for immediately. In the interval, the following directions may be followed. Articles like cinders, dust, and other small objects may be removed from the eye if one has a steady hand, but the eye should not be rubbed and should be kept closed, except when one is trying to remove the foreign substance. The tears by themselves will often wash out ordinary dust or cinders. If the substance is hidden from view, one or two grains of whole flaxseed may remove it. Catch the upper lid by the lashes and pull away from the eyeball over the lower lid, holding it there for a moment, and request the patient to blow his nose vigorously. 
visible articles may be removed with a piece of gauze on the hand or an absolutely clean cloth but don't touch the eye with the finger as the eye is a very delicate organ the novice should not attempt to operate upon it nose blow the nose very hard and close one side of the nostril by pressing your finger against it tickle the nose or give snuff to excite sneezing Sometimes the article will be removed if the patient takes a long breath and closes his mouth. Then give him a sharp blow on the back. If the body is not discharged, call a physician. Ear There is great danger in tampering with the ear. Never insert needles or pins in an attempt to remove foreign substances. Better sent for a physician. If live insects enter the ear, Pour a small quantity of sweet oil or glycerin into the ear and very gently syringe it with warm water. Throat Send for a physician immediately and tell him what you think the matter is so he may bring the necessary instruments. If there is no difficulty in breathing, wait for the physician. Slap the person on the back when the body is bent forward with face downwards, which will cause him to cough. Elevate him so that his head is lower than his body and slap him on the back while in this position. Getting wet. Many colds are contracted on account of exposure to rain and moisture. Unless able to change your clothes, keep moving. It is said that very few colds are contracted while one is exercising. Headaches. Under no circumstances take a headache powder or any drug whatsoever without the advice of your physician. Many headache powders contain dangerous drugs which work upon the heart, sometimes causing death. Headaches almost invariably come from a cause not located in the head itself. Do not attempt to cure it yourself. The headache powder may relieve the headache temporarily at the expense of the system. Hiccups Drink a glass full of cold water as rapidly as possible. Breathe deeply. If the hiccups continue, call a physician. End of section 70 Section 71 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org How to avoid accidents Never cross the street without looking both ways. Do not get off of a car or other vehicle while it is in motion. Never thrust your head or arms out of the car or other vehicle. When it is lightning, avoid trees and metallic articles. Never allow firearms to be lying about. Have some one place for them and be sure that no one can get at them. Move quickly when it is cold, and when any part is frozen, do not go near the fire, but rub with snow. Always change wet clothing as soon as possible and keep moving until you have the opportunity to change. Never walk on a railroad track. Do not light a fire with kerosene or other inflammable fluid. Never enter a cellar or anywhere else where gas is escaping with a light in your hand. Under no circumstances touch a wire hanging in the street. Maintain a medicine chest containing all of the common remedies, but don't select them without the advice of your physician. Mark each bottle plainly, with directions under the label. Never take medicine without looking at the label beforehand. Illuminating gas. Summon a physician, and before he arrives, proceed as follows. Remove the patient into fresh air and walk him around. Place his arms about your shoulders, and if there are two rescuers, place one arm around the shoulders of each. A glass of waste beer should be given while the patient is walking, as it removes gas from the stomach. In five minutes, give half a teaspoonful of aromatic spirits of ammonia in a third of a glass of water. Repeat this dose every 15 minutes until four doses have been given. The neck of the beer bottle may be forced into a patient's mouth. Infectious diseases. 
It is now generally supposed that all contagious and communicable diseases are contracted by the germs which pass into the body or system. These germs are so small that millions of them may enter the body through the nose, throat, and skin. They do little or no harm to a healthy person, for the healthy body is opposed to their growth, but if one is weak, or suffering from a slight cold, or is depressed, they may multiply and cause diseases. These germs may be wildly scattered, in the clothes, bedding, carpets, and in the hair and skin. They cling to walls and ceilings, and they will multiply on almost any kind of food. No one can wholly prevent coming into contact with them, but he can, if he will, avoid most of the contagious diseases by never sitting down in the sick room, especially avoiding the bed, and keeping away from the walls and furniture. He should wash his hands with antiseptic soap after handling the patient. Exercise regularly in the open air. Nurses should wear washable dresses, which are frequently changed and a washable cap should cover the hair. When in the sick room, do not approach the patient near enough to catch his breath. Do not touch with your lips any food, dish or utensil which has been in the sick room. Do not eat or drink in the sick room. Wear no clothing that the patient wore before being taken sick. Never touch the sick person if your hands are sore or scratched, and be sure to wash them after contact with them. Never allow the dishes used by the patient to be used by any other unless they are very carefully washed and scalded in boiling water. All articles of food not eaten by the patient should be burned, and milk and food should never be allowed to stand in the sick room. All bodily discharges should be immediately removed and covered with disinfecting solution, and the vessels should be washed with antiseptics before being brought back into the room. Lockjaw. Do not attempt to cure it. Consult your physician. It would probably be fatal. Mustard plasters. Plasters occasionally are efficacious, but most give more apparent than real relief. They should not be used indiscriminately or without the advice of a physician. Neuralgia. This is often incurable, but may be relieved. Certain liniments are efficacious, but are not to be recommended indiscriminately. Better consult your physician. End of section 71. Section 72 of 1000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. 1000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Poison. Poisons taken into the system through the mouth and not through the blood require a different treatment. Poisons may be classified as follows. 1. Irritant, in which the symptoms appear entirely at the location of the poison. 2. Systemic, in which the poison affects the system at large in addition to producing local irritation. 3. Narcotic or sleep-producing. and 4. General, in which there is no local irritation. In the first mentioned, it is best not to cause vomiting. Give dilute acids to neutralize alkalis and dilute alkalis to neutralize acids. Then administer oil, raw egg, or flour and water. Small doses of opiates may be given to quiet the pain and whiskey or other spirituous liquor to relieve weakness. In the second class, except for arsenic or similar poisoning, no emetic should be given. The poison may be counteracted by bland doses of oil, flour, and water, white of eggs, and stimulating drinks should be given to counteract depression. In the third class, make strenuous effort to produce vomiting, then give strong coffee or other stimulating drinks, and make every effort to keep the patient awake, even if you have to keep him walking. Fourth class, give emetics and follow with stimulating drinks to relieve weakness and pain. The patient should be allowed to rest. Poisoning. Poisoning by acids. For sulfuric, muriatic, nitric, and acetic acids, give immediately a solution of baking soda or magnesia, chalk, lime, soap suds, or chalk tooth powder, followed by raw eggs, milk, or sweet oil. 
for carbolic acid or creosote give alcohol and immediately castor oil sweet oil raw eggs or milk followed by an emetic for oxalic acid administer lime chalk or magnesia lime may be scraped from the wall or ceiling and dissolved in water but don't use soda potash or ammonia for prussic acid generally the patient dies immediately but if he is still living do not stop to give emetics but administer stimulants apply hot and cold douches and use artificial respiration for aconite poisoning wash the stomach with a stomach tube and avoid emetics use stimulants apply warmth to the extremities and place mustard plasters over the heart and legs if the patient is insensible use artificial respiration for camphor give emetics oils and eggs apply warmth to the extremities for chloroform if caused by inhalation resort to artificial respiration and apply friction place the patient in the fresh air keeping the head very low alternate hot and cold applications if it occurs from internal use administer large doses of bicarbonate of soda in water administer artificial respiration if the patient is insensible for nux vomica tobacco chewing or smoking and animal charcoal dissolved in water follow with emetics use artificial respiration when necessary for opium administer an emetic such as mustard or ipecac apply water to the head face and spine give strong coffee but do not give alcoholic stimulants keep the patient aroused by walking whipping or other means use artificial respiration if necessary for arsenic give emetics immediately including drafts of hot greasy water or salt and water administer in large doses magnesia or lime scraped from the walls or ceilings Give castor oil, sweet oil, or equal parts of sweet oil and lime water, or raw eggs. Use stimulants well diluted. For corrosive sublimate, administer an emetic and large doses of white of eggs, milk, mucilage, barley water, or flour and water. Force the patient to swallow large quantities. Use the stomach pump. For poisonous mushrooms, give emetics, castor oil, stimulants, and apply heat. End of section 72. Section 73 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pulse. The average rate of the pulse in adults is 76 beats every minute, but it varies according to age. At birth, it is from 130 to 140. First year, 115 to 130. Second year, 100 to 115. Third year, 95 to 105. Between 7 and 14, 80 to 90. Between 14 and 21, 75 to 80. Between 21 and 60, 70 to 75. In all age, from 75 to 80. The female pulse is from 10 to 15 beats quicker than that of the male of the same age. To count the pulse, place the finger over the artery at the wrist. Count the beats for 15 seconds, multiply this by 4, and the result is the number of beats a minute. Do not use the thumb as there is a sort of pulse in it which interferes with counting. Rheumatism So far as is known, there is no certain cure for rheumatism, notwithstanding the many nostrums that are advertised as sure cures. Rheumatism may be helped by avoiding meat and other nitrogenous foods, confining the diet to vegetables and similar foods, and drinking water freely. Rheumatism, however, is too serious to be treated by other than a physician. Scalds and burns. Place the patient in a comfortable and safe place to remove the clothing rapidly with a knife or scissors. If it sticks, cut away as much as is necessary, but don't pull it off. Clothing may sometimes be removed by sprinkling with water or oil. Do not expose the surface of the burn or scald to the air. 
Cover as quickly as possible with flour or vaseline and wrap a cloth about it wet with a solution of water and common baking soda. If the clothing is afire, force the person to lie down immediately. Wrap him in a blanket or other piece of cloth, preferably of woolen. Do not allow him to run around or expose himself to a draught. Fire may be extinguished by slapping the burning pads with a cloth or throwing water upon the person, but the wrapping process is better because it immediately smothers the fire and water is not always available. Slight scalds or burns may be relieved by the application of a solution made of a pint of water with one teaspoonful of baking soda or saleratus. Apply with a piece of lint and then cover the burn or scald with absorbent cotton held in place by a bandage. If the burn or scald is severe, apply sweet oil, olive oil, vaseline or the white of an egg. If these are not handy, cover the spot with starch or use damp earth. Burns caused by lye and other alkaline chemicals should be covered with water, then with vinegar, then treated as those by fire. Burns caused by acids and vitriol should be soaked with water and thoroughly washed with soda, saleratus, or lime water. Chalk or tooth powder may be used when saleratus is not available. Carbolic acid burns may be treated with strong alcohol. Burns of the mouth or throat coming from the drinking of hot fluids may be treated by taking oil or the white of an egg into the mouth and allowing it to run into the throat if the throat is affected. Vinegar should be used for burns in the mouth coming from caustic potash and ammonia. If the burn is serious, summon the doctor. Burns caused by gunpowder should be treated the same as our ordinary burns. End of section 73 Section 74 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. One Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Section 74. Shock or Collapse. Shock or collapse frequently occurs after serious accidents. It can be foretold generally, because the skin is cool and clammy, and it is usually accompanied with vomiting or rapid pulse, irregular breathing or sighing, and the eyelids may be heavy, the pupils dilated, and the mind is not active. Insensibility frequently accompanies a shock. Send for a surgeon or doctor immediately. Place the patient in a warm bed if possible, cover him with blankets, and allow his head to lie low. Remove all clothing, cutting it to save time. Wrap bandages around wounds or broken bones. Hot cloths or hot water bags or a hot brick wrapped in cloth should be applied to the region of the heart, the pit of the stomach, and the feet. If wet cloths are used, wring them out frequently in hot water and reapply them. It is not necessary to use heat sufficient to burn the skin. Under no circumstances apply heat to the head. If possible, force the patient to drink hot water, hot tea, hot coffee, or hot milk. Malted milk is excellent, but it should be hot. Whiskey or other alcoholic liquor should not be given, except by the advice of a doctor. Half a teaspoonful of aromatic spirits of ammonia in water may be given every 15 minutes for four doses, but not more. Stimulants should not be given after the patient begins to recover. Vomiting may be stopped or relieved by administering a little brandy mixed with cracked ice. If the skull is injured, or there is a concussion of the brain with or without the appearance of apoplexy or severe breathing, do not administer a stimulant. Sleeplessness Insomnia rapidly lowers the vital forces. It is due to several causes, including mental worry, indigestion, physical overexercise, and functional or organic diseases. Insomnia may be considered a natural warning of coming ailment. The cause should be located, and a good physician should be consulted. Sleep is encouraged by exercise in the open air and by taking hot drinks just before retiring. Hot malted milk is excellent, but solid food should not be taken just before retiring. Mild gymnastic exercise may be taken before an open window, but drugs should never be administered without the advice of a physician. Snake Bite Do not waste valuable time to kill the snake. If the bite is venomous, rip open the clothing so that the wound will be exposed. 
Tie a handkerchief or rope around the arm or leg above the bite. It should be drawn so tight that the circulation will be stopped or retarded. The use of a stick or pencil will assist in giving pressure. With a knife, open the holes made by the snake's fangs and cut around the wound liberally, being careful not to sever an artery. Let the blood run freely. Poison is sometimes removed by sucking a wound, but one should not do this if his lips are chapped or bleeding. The wound should be washed with soda solution and large doses of whiskey or brandy should be administered. Call a surgeon immediately. Sore throat. Sore throat may be merely local or be a forerunner of diphtheria. Better consult a physician. End of section 74. Section 75 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. One Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Section 75. Sprains. Most sprains are serious and a doctor should be called at once, but before he arrives the following simple treatment may be applied. Sprains twist and tear the ligaments and may rupture the small blood vessels. The flow of blood may be checked by application of cold or heat or by pressure. If the ankle or foot is sprained, wrap a folded towel tightly around the part sprained and then apply moist heat and elevate the leg. Immerse the foot in water as hot as can be borne and keep on adding hot water for about 20 minutes so that the temperature may not be lowered. Then apply a bandage, but continue the bathing treatment. Cold applications may be used instead of hot water and should be applied by dipping cloths in ice water frequently and wrapping them about the parts injured. Stings of poisonous insects, or of scorpions, centipedes, etc., should be treated with hartshorn, ammonia, after which cold water or cracked ice should be applied. Do not fail to call a surgeon or doctor. If the sting remains in the wound, remove it either by pressure on the skin or with a knife. The stings of common insects, such as mosquitoes, ants, etc., should be treated with a weak solution of ammonia, salt water, or a cloth wet with water in which a teaspoonful of baking soda to a pint of water is dissolved may be bound on it. Suffocation. Always summon a physician. Place the patient in the air. Remove all tight clothing about the neck and chest and apply artificial respiration. Apply hot water in bottles to the body. Put mustard plasters above the heart, on the soles of his feet, and on his wrists. When the patient shows signs of recovering, give mild stimulants. If the patient is in a close room, open the windows and all of the doors. In rescue work, do not open windows, but smash out all of the glass. In entering a room full of smoke, cover the mouth with a handkerchief wet with water or vinegar and water. Crawl on the floor, as the smoke is less dense near the floor. The rescuer should attach a rope to himself so he can be pulled from his dangerous position. Sunstroke Indications of sunstroke or heat prostration are a slow but full pulse, very labored breathing, and the skin is hot and dry, the face usually red, and the person affected is unconscious. Remove the sufferer to a shady place, and be sure to loosen his collar and clothing, if tight. Raise the head and shoulders. The head, face, and chest should be drenched with cold water, and if it is very hot, use cracked ice. In ordinary cases of heat prostration, the patient is not unconscious, the skin is pale and clammy, and the breathing is not normal. Force the patient to lie on his back with his head level with his body and loosen all tight clothing. Apply heat to the extremities and cold to the head. The patient should not be allowed to drink too much water. Give him hot drinks and apply heat to the spine and feet. Under no circumstances administer alcoholic stimulants. Always send for a physician. End of section 75. Section 76 of 1000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Section 76. Temperature of the body. The normal body temperature is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. When it is higher, the patient is supposed to have a fever. Temperature usually rises in the afternoon 
being one degree higher than in the first part of the night or in the early morning. It gradually falls from midnight to six or seven o'clock in the morning. The temperature of a child frequently rises two degrees from slight causes. Every family should carry a clinical thermometer. Bodily temperature should be taken by holding it in the mouth under the tongue for two minutes. Temperature under 101 degrees indicates a slight fever. Under 103 degrees, a moderate fever. Under 105 degrees, a high fever. When the temperature rises two or three degrees above normal, send for a doctor at once. Temperature of the sick room. 68 degrees Fahrenheit is a good average temperature for the sick room. In certain diseases, the average temperature may be lower, and for throat or chest affections, it should be higher. When the patient is being washed or dressed, the temperature should be kept at about 70 degrees. Toothache. If the nerve is exposed, or nearly so, toothache may be cured by placing in the cavity a small piece of cotton soaked in creosote or oil of cloves. If it continues, consult a dentist. Transporting the wounded. Great care should be taken, because the slightest carelessness is likely to cause intense suffering. A four-handed seat may be made by two persons, the hands of each one clasping one of the wrists of the other, and two ordinary men can easily carry a person of average weight. A stretcher will carry the patient in a horizontal position if the persons carrying it place their hands under it. A stretcher may be made of boards, over which are placed coats or shawls, or a blanket may be fastened to two stout poles. If no poles are handy, a shawl, tightly held by two persons will do, but great care should be taken to keep it tight. A window shutter is generally available. The sufferer should be very carefully placed upon the stretcher, and had better be lifted by several persons, by two at least. The bearers of the stretcher should not keep step. The opposite feet should be put forward at the same time to prevent swaying of the stretcher and the rolling of the patient. Never carry the stretcher on the shoulders. Carry the patient feet foremost, except when going uphill. In case of a fractured thigh or leg, carry the patient head first when going downhill. Ventilation. The sick room should never be without fresh air. Impure and close air breeds disease and encourages illness. Fresh air should be introduced constantly and steadily. The windows may be lowered at the top or patented ventilators used. To change the air, open the windows in an adjoining room and then open the door between the rooms but the fresh air in the adjoining room should be warm before it is allowed to penetrate the sick room. By swinging the door back and forth, the air will be fanned in. Do not maintain the erroneous impression that cold air is pure because it is cold, for cold air may be as foul as warm air. Night air is not dangerous. The patient must breathe night air or closed-in day air, and closed-in air rapidly becomes foul. Vomiting lie down and hold small pieces of ice in your mouth if it continues consult a physician end of section 76 section 77 of 1000 things worth knowing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by russell newton 1,000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Section 77. Wills. A will, untechnically speaking, is virtually a bill of sale or transfer of property by its owner to those he may designate, but differs from the ordinary bill of sale in that there is no consideration mentioned on the part of those who will receive the property, and the will is not operative until the death of the maker of it. No one can execute a will unless he is presumably in his right mind and knows what he is doing. Nor can a will be made by an idiot or one insane. The will must be signed and witnessed by several witnesses, each witness signing as a witness in the presence of all the other witnesses. While it would appear that everyone has a right to dispose of his property as he chooses, a will is not likely to stand in law if it can be proved that the maker of it was under undue or unfair influence and, therefore, distributed his property to the prejudices of those who would be entitled to it if no will was made. For example, a, a will is not likely to hold good if its maker unfairly disowned close legal heirs like a wife, husband, or children, or bequeathed his property to some institution which it could be shown he probably would not have done 
had not unfair pressure been brought to bear upon him at the time he made his will. All legal heirs should, as a rule, be mentioned in the will, even though they are given insignificant sums. As the laws differ in the several states, it is suggested that it is better and safer to consult a good lawyer or one familiar with conditions. Wireless Telegraphy The exact date of the discovery or invention of wireless telegraphy is not accurately known. Many scientists discovered it theoretically before Marconi made it practical. Some scientific authorities claim that it was originated by Professor Dolbear of Massachusetts. In 1899, messages were sent from England to France, and recently an intelligible message was flashed across the Atlantic Ocean. Unscientifically speaking, wireless telegraphy consists of discharging powerful electric currents into the atmosphere, their vibrations being taken up by the natural electricity in the air and received by wires placed at an elevation. Practically all seagoing steamers are equipped with wireless telegraphy. Woman's Suffrage The first convention in the interest of woman's rights was held July 19, 1808, at Seneca Falls, New York. In 1850, a National Woman's Rights Convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. From that time, woman's suffrage was agitated in America and in England, and many of the leading women of the world strongly advocated it. It is growing rapidly and is being recognized throughout the country, although all of the states have not given the vote to women. Under the Constitution of the United States, a native-born woman may hold any office, including that of president, even though the woman in all states cannot vote at the presidential election. The Constitution of the United States does not recognize sex, and in the eye of national law, women have all of the rights of men. End of section 77. Section 78 of 1,000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 1,000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Women Voters Many of the towns, cities, and states give full franchise to women, while others allow them to vote for only a few officials. Women's suffrage, or the right to vote, is spreading rapidly, and it is probably only a question of time before she will have full franchise throughout the entire country. There is nothing in the Constitution of the United States to prevent a woman from holding the office of president or vice president if she was born in this country, and she can hold such offices even though she may not be permitted by state law to vote for them. Wool Industry The United States produces about $320,000 worth of wool in a year and weaves about 55,500,000 square yards worth about $40,500,000. World's Largest Steamships The Imperator, just placed in commission, is the world's largest vessel. She is 919 feet long, 98 feet beam, and 62 feet deep. The boat deck is 100 feet, and the trunks of the mast 246 feet above the keel. The funnels are 69 feet long with oval openings, 29 by 18 feet. The rudder alone weighs 90 tons. She is registered at 50,000 tons, with a displacement of 70,000 tons. Displacement represents the weight of the water which is occupied by that part of the hull under water. The ship is a modern floating hotel, containing a grill room, a tea garden, a veranda cafe, several ladies' sitting rooms, a palm garden, a ballroom, a gymnasium, a swimming tank, and other accessories. In the first cabin there are 220 regular bathrooms and showers, including 150 private bathrooms. The state rooms do not contain berths, metal bedsteads being used throughout. The entrance hall is 90 feet wide and 69 feet long. In addition, the vessel carries a drugstore, a bookstore and a flower shop, and several passenger elevators are maintained. To illuminate the ship, there are 9,500 electric lamps. The Roman bath is 65 feet long and 41 feet wide. 
The swimming bath is 39 feet long, 21 feet wide, and 9 feet deep. The quadruple turbine engines have 72,000 horsepower and develop an average speed of 22.5 knots an hour. One of the immense rotors contains 50,000 blades and weighs 135 tons. The ship carries a crew of 1,100 persons, a complete fire department, and wireless telegraphy. If the Imperator was set on end, she would be higher than the largest building in the world, which is 750 feet high. The ship has a passenger capacity equal to the population of a large town. Yankee. This word is said to be a corruption of English Anglais, pronounced by the Massachusetts Indians, who gave this name to the New England colonists, Yengis, Yangis, or Yankees. It was applied to the New Englanders by the British soldiers during the Revolutionary War, and to the Federal soldiers by the Confederates during the Civil War. Yankee Doodle The origin of Yankee Doodle, perhaps the most famous American national air, is unknown. It is supposed to have been an English tune. At any rate, it was introduced into America by the British troops in 1775. End of section 78. End of 1,000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr.